Thank you, Danny and Caleb. I, I often said that uh, I think Tom looks in the bulletin to see what my sermon topic is, and that's what he talks about in class. But he doesn't do that. It just works out that way. It seems like. So this morning for you in Bible class, we had a lot of discussion about nature, and that's what I want us to talk about today. And I uh, also appreciate Danny's comment in the prayer because it was part of my lead-in for the lesson. And that is that, you know, we celebrate the 4th, and it is an important holiday, and it's appropriate that we celebrate it. But it's, but it's very American. Uh, it is unique to our nation. And as the song that we just sang is, is God is the ruler of all nations. And it's important for us to keep that in perspective. Uh, uh, that uh, with all of our patriotism, which is so appropriate, that we are very careful to remember uh, that God is the ruler of all peoples and all lands. And that's a really important principle for the Lord's church uh, to keep in mind. Uh, if you look at the first part of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, uh, Solomon, Solomon makes some interesting comments right there at the beginning. He says, the sun rises and the sun goes down. The, the wind goes uh, toward the south and then it turns and goes to the north and it just runs in a cycle. He says, the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea isn't full. To the place from which the rivers come, they return again. The commentaries say that what Solomon is trying to remind us of early in the book of Ecclesiastes is sort of the monotonous nature of the world that we live in. That God created it that way. And when he says that there's nothing new under the sun... Uh, that he's expressing that because he wants us to understand that while nature is always somewhat the same, that God who made it doesn't change. Uh, one particular commentary that I liked, a guy by the name of Meyer, said, All the rivers of earthly joy may be flowing into your hearts, but they'll never fill it. They may recede, or they may dry up, or ebb, but if not, still they will never satisfy. But in Christ, there is perennial interest. We need to go out. We do not need to go outside of Him for new delights. And to know Him is to possess a secret, which makes all things new. That God is the one who has given us all of the evidences. You know, we talk about nature, often it's talked about in the context of Christian evidences. And this morning, Tom mentioned in Bible class a person who he works with who's uh, wanting to know how to prove uh, the things that you and I believe, that there is one true Jehovah God. It's basically what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to notice that how many lessons that we get from nature that God found a way through inspiration of the Holy Spirit to include those concepts has very powerful lessons in the Word of God. And I've picked off just a handful for us to talk about. The first is the one that we almost always start with, and that is that the existence of nature proves the existence of God. Because nature is so precise, and that's part of what what Solomon was saying, if you see it, it happens over and over and over again. And, and, and if you ever wonder, uh, where does all of that water go? You know, when it rains, you remember when it rained? When it, when it eventually rains, you know, where does all that... The water goes into the creeks, and the creeks go into the lake, or rivers and lakes, and, and, and rivers flow into the sea. But the seas, we're told, are getting less... Where, how does all of that happen? Well, God's plan has been put into action. And some have said that if we would just simply look around at what all we have around us, we have what they refer to as a natural theology. Think about those two terms together. Theology, the nature of study of God. We have a natural theology. The Bible asserts that there is testimony to the fact that God not only exists, 
but that there is precision in what he has created. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament, which we often think about the skies. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. The night unto night reveals his knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. This last year we decided that we wanted to go backwards and we wound up putting a hot tub in our deck, which there had been one there many years ago. And, and one of my favorite things to do now is at, at night, at bedtime, is to go out there and sit and look at the skies. The, the stars are so incredible. And, and if we think about what the psalmist said, it is the glory of God that we're seeing there. In Acts, uh, talking to Lystra, Paul said, you, you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. Verse 17, he reminded, Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from the heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and with gladness. I, for one, stood there yesterday morning with gladness in my heart watching the rain of 22 that 15 minute shower that we got you didn't get one sorry um, and, and, and when you think about the, 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 the things that we see the, the gladness that we receive from the fact that, that God has, has laid all this out and put all this into motion last night at, at Jake and Kayla's house I don't know if you noticed but there was a basket there that had all kinds of, of squashes and stuff in them and I think you know it's pretty cool that all of this stuff, you know, comes forth from the efforts that they have made and what God has done to make those go forward. In, in Romans chapter 1, he says, For God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And that's what we talked about in Bible class this morning, Romans 1, 19. His invisible attributes, you get to see because you get to see what He made. That is the handiwork of God that gives evidence to His testimony. Nature gives us all kinds of lessons. Lessons like lessons the Scriptures include about what the kingdom is like. In Matthew 13, a parable he put forth him saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man sowed in the field, which is indeed least of all the seeds. When it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air will come and rest or nest in its branches. And so that tiny mustard seed, and what you and I know, is that the efforts that are put forth, we get a chance to see how that growth occurs. And nature and scripture tie together to show us a lesson about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise and day and the seed should spring up and grow up. He knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and then after that the full corn in the ear. And when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. We talked Jake and Kayla into planting silver queen corn. And he said, that's it out there. All of those dry things that you see brown, that's your silver queen. You know, the planting of the seeds, it comes forth. And when we see what a farmer does and, and he goes to bed and, and it begins to sprout, the scripture says he doesn't know how that all works. It, it's a partnership with God that, that man has done what he could do to plant the seed and the word of God works invisibly in that way. Like it works invisibly in you and me. And so when we're told that we have responsibility to be sowers of the seed, the reason is you and I don't know what's going to happen. We're told in 1 Corinthians 3, I planted Apollos water, God gave the increase. 
so neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but it's God who makes that happen. And we're supposed to be seed sowers. And Lisa sent me this picture uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, you might be able to use this in a sermon somewhere along the way. And as I looked at it, I got to thinking about it. Uh, last night, Grant gave me a, a detailed lecture on what dynamite does to rocks. Here's, a, here's the sowing of a seed and, and what the sowing of a seed can do over time. You and I are supposed to be seed sowers. That, that we can water, we can, we can provide. But it's God who's going to allow things to happen. It's God who's going to make the difference. All of that works spontaneously in nature, we're told, and it's part of the evidence of both God's creation and the existence of God. Now there are lessons that we're told that are natural lessons that we can see according to Scripture as spiritual lessons, like the lesson of the sun. Malachi 4 is an interesting word play in verse 2. But to you who fear my name, look at this, the sun of righteousness shall arise with feeling in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed caves. Now, you and I know the sun. What? You said caves. Caves, caves. I was watching her put on the glasses, okay? <laughs> How am I supposed to preach when she's that cute? Put your glasses on, show her what you look like. Stall fed caves. Um, the, the sun of righteousness. That, that, that word sun is not a misprint, it's not a typo. It, it makes reference to S U N, son of righteousness. And everybody since the first century have understood that what Malachi was talking about was Christ. Who, who is in many ways the son of righteousness. And, and there are so many passages that make reference to, to things like the planets and the stars. And, uh, and you can look at some of those in, in Psalm 84 and Isaiah 60 and Revelation 22 and Numbers 24 all make references to planets, to stars. Here the Messiah is the sun, but it's a special type of sun. It's a sun of righteousness. It's a sun that has the ability to bring forth healing. Uh, they, they talk about the fact that um, elderly people often do well in warmer climates. Why is that? Because there is some healing power that occurs in those warmer climates, that the sun provides some healing. And, and that we know that, that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are found in Christ Jesus. And, and so when we look at the natural world, we are reminded of the spiritual world of things like the scriptures talks about roots and stars. Now, the roots and offspring of David, according to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1 says, that a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. And so the prophecy was that the line of Christ was going to come forth as a branch from the root of David, or the stump of Jesse, as it is referred to. And it shows God is both the, the creator and the descendant. And so we know that I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. The picture on the left, the picture on the left is the morning star. If you go out right before daybreak and you look into the east, you can find this star if you know what you're looking for. And for centuries it has been referred to as the morning star. It is actually the planet Venus. And that's the morning star. 
And then how many of you have been somewhere, sometime, where you got up early enough because you wanted to see that sunrise? It is magnificent. It is awe-inspiring. It is a reminder that God is bringing forth sun after sun and moon after moon, and that when we see that, we know about the permanency, the existence, and the incredible perfection of the creation that you and I get to enjoy. And we're told that Christ is the morning star. <coughs> and heralds the day in which the one is going to come again. When he will come again and he will bring home his salvation, his people of God who have been faithful followers of his, is with the rising of the morning star. And then we see lessons that are very familiar to us. You know, like the, the natural world reminds us of the spiritual when we talk about the rock. Um, Psalm 89, He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God. Notice this. You are my Father. You are my God. You are the rock of my salvation. How hard is the rock? Friday, lunch. We're sitting at Farmer's Restaurant. All of a sudden, boom! The whole place shook. I literally shook. Everybody. What in the world was that? A lady sitting across from us said, we live over here. They're building townhouses right next door, and they're dynamiting over there. Why? Because you can't move those rocks otherwise. That's what we want. We want a mighty rock. We want a rock of salvation. And we want a rock that like that picture of the seed that grew the tree through the middle of the rock. We want a rock that is so strong that only God knows how to penetrate it. Probably. And that's what we're looking for. And the rock, he is only my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge of God. How many times in history have we seen where in order to build the strongest fortress, they knew where to put it. Put it up on top of the rock. That's where it was going to stand. And that's why we're reminded of the natural world and the spiritual when we have the kids who sing the song. The wise man built his house. We know, according to that song and according to Scripture, what happens when he builds it on the sand. It's not going to have the ability to withstand it. It's going to fall. We also know from Scripture what happens and why you build on the rock. Because it will withstand when the sand is going to be washed away and the fall is going to be uh, collapsing and great. And so we're taught a lesson in Scripture that is based in nature that's supposed to remind us what we're supposed to do spiritually. God used nature in that way. We find out about grass. Uh, here Peter quotes from uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6 through 8, All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of the Lord has endured forever. In A.D. 303, the Roman emperor Diocletian ordered that all Bibles were to be rounded up and destroyed. The Roman emperor, the most powerful person in the world, gather up all the Bibles and destroy them. And when he said all, he didn't mean all but a few, he meant all of them. 25 years later, the Roman Emperor Constantine sent forth a decree and a commission for a scholar by the name of Eusebius to prepare 50 copies of the Bible at government expense to be dispersed. The Bible doesn't fade away. Flesh will fade God's still there. God's word still remains. 
As one person said, God's word never dies, God's word never changed. There are a few who think we ought to get a new gospel every few years or even every few weeks, but that wasn't Peter's notion. He wrote that it was divinely inspired to write concerning the word of God which lives and abides forever. Nature has played a significant role in providing for us information about what the Bible was supposed to teach us. But the lesson is... Why are rivers crooked? Now, I gave a few people a heads up last night that that was going to be the lesson. Because the answer is the same whether we're talking about a river or talking about a man. And here's what we know. That a river becomes crooked because it takes the path of the least resistance. That's why it runs the way that it does. And when we think about it, note what the Scriptures tell us about what happens when we introduce God into the world. I will bring the blind by a way they didn't know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. Isaiah, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I'll break the pieces in pieces, the gates of bronze, and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places so that you can know that I am the Lord. And when they were talking about the message that John the Baptist was putting out there in Luke 3, make his path straight, every valley shall be filled, every mountain hill brought low, the crooked places shall be made straight. When we think about what nature does relative to rivers, it is the direction and the... the, the the line that it is because it has taken the path of least resistance. You and I face a lot of resistance. And what we're told is that we're supposed to walk a straight path. It's what Hebrews 12 says. What Matthew 7 reminds us. Enter in at the narrow gate or the straight gate. For why is the gate that leads to destruction? And there are many that go in and narrows the gate. It's difficult and the way which leads to life, there are few who find it. And it's that whole notion of you're instructed that you're supposed to stay on the straight and narrow, and yet at the same time, to do that, you're going to face lots of resistance. And so it's easier in many ways just to avoid the resistance and go on like the rivers do. How hard is it to make a road straight? We're told the shortest distance between two points, what? is a straight line. The Hebrew word for crooked means fraudulent, deceitful, sly, or slippery. The Greek word means crooked, perverse, wicked, and curved. It, it relates to the notion of following things that are deceitful. That's what crooked means according to Scripture. And so if you want to take the straight path, You've got to avoid the crooked path because the crooked path is what leads to all of these other things. Now, if you want to make a road and you want to straighten that thing out, you sometimes will have to go up there and you've got to cut through mountains and you've got to build bridges over things and you've got to raise up valleys in order to make that road go straight. You and I are supposed to be on the straight path. And yet we're told in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 that our hearts are inherently crooked. They're wicked. They're deceitful. They are sly in their approach. And so if we want to follow the straight road, we have to decide how much effort are we willing to put in. And because we know this, when you and I are trying to walk the straight path, we're going to run into resistance. Externally, you know, we've had the lessons. We, we, we know there are going to be tribulations that are going to come. We know there are going to be fiery trials that we're going to have to endure. Those are the things that we try all that we can to avoid. And yet, if we're going to stay true to our faith, we have to work through those things. And we know that external challenges are going to try to continue to come to us. And they can come in all kinds of ways. You know, they can come in, 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 in getting the call that, you, that your child has been 
in an accident. They can come when you're told that you have a disease. They can come when you're told that, that your investments have been stolen. They can come in any number of ways. And, and they can come on a regular basis, even when you don't see it. Yesterday, I got a message from my brother. He just got a letter that said his Medicaid had been denied. You know, challenges. They're external issues that all of us can get frustrated with if we allow ourselves to do so. But we also know, according to Scripture, their internal resistance. What did we say the nature of the heart was? Where do desires originate? You know, it, it's the external things that we have to put up with, the roadblocks, the challenges. It's the internal side of us that can create some of the greatest challenges for us. We just recently have been talking about where does adultery begin? We talked about that on Wednesday night. Well, it begins in the eye. It begins in the heart. And the scripture says, Jesus said, you can you have committed adultery even without committing the act. Why? Because it's an internal act. And that's part of what we have to encounter if we're going to overcome it. And we know about all kinds of examples of people who made life more challenging by putting crooked paths out there. You can go back and read Matthew chapter 26 and 27, the, the trial of Jesus, and basically in chapter 27, what Pilate says is, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. I'm washing my hands in this matter. You take care of it. You see, he made that more difficult for Christ. Uh, Aaron, in Exodus chapter 32, Moses comes down and says, what is the deal with this golden calf? And, and Aaron said, you know how these people are? You leave them alone for a little while, they're going to be caught up in sin. And Aaron allowed it to happen. He made the path more difficult. Felix is an interesting character in, in Acts 24. If you read Acts 24, and I hope you'll go back and look at this, here's what you find. Felix sits down and Paul teaches him. Now, now, now Paul is, is having some challenges in his own life. But Felix comes and he listens. And, and according to the scripture, it looks like Felix kept coming back on a regular basis to hear more about what Paul had to say. Why? He was interested. I think he was learning. I think he was believing. And at the end of Acts 24, basically it says, Paul was up for the death penalty. And Felix just washed his hands of the matter away. Demas, classic example of Demas. He's included in Philemon 24 as the great followers of Christ, Colossians 4, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you, and it's believed that at the time when Paul was in prison on his second time in Rome, that Demas was there with him. But we find out that he turns out to be a, a deserter. Why? Because he knew what was about to happen to Paul. He didn't want to have any part of it. And basically, the scripture tells us that he got out of Thessalonica. He wasn't going to be part of that. And, and we see the, the disappointment on the part of Paul because Demas took the path of least resistance rather than standing up for what he knew. And then we have great examples of those who did create straight paths. Like Joseph. You know, he had lots of opportunities to, uh, to, to take a different path, but he was willing to stay true to it. And Moses and all of the challenges in Hebrews 11 talks about you know, the great faith of him. Those three, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in, in Daniel 3, I mean, if there was ever a classic example of people who, who chose not the path of least resistance, you know, our Daniel, all he had to do was bow down. Nope. He's going to go to the open window and be seen praying three times a day because it was his manner. Didn't take the path of least resistance, took the path that was the straight and narrow, but was going to be a challenge. And you can contrast all of those biblical stories and see people who did the right thing, particularly under difficult circumstances, and those who chose not to. But we can. You know, that's what 1 Corinthians 10 says. You, you can do that. You can meet the, both the internal and the external temptations and resistance and challenges. He has given us the ability to overcome. But our obstacles are going to be there and we have to decide. 
And it very well could be, as James says, that those are simply intended to be tests for you to demonstrate what kind of a faith you had. In order to do that, we have to remember, keep the Word of God in us. I've hid it in my heart, the psalmist said. And what happens if we remember the Word of God? Well, we'll walk not in the ways of the world. And that's the caution in 1 John 2. Don't love the world, the things that are in the world. If you do, the love of the Father is in you. In James 4, friendship with the world is in me too with God. We have to remember why it's important to remember the Word of God. It is what keeps us on the path we're supposed to be rather than taking the path of least resistance and just following after it. That's what sends us through the world with those challenges. And that's why it's so important that we be together. We, we have to grow off of one another. You know, we're supposed to... That, that, we, we always talk about Hebrews 10.25, and the first phrase gets lots of press. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's that next part, though, that is so important in my mind. We're supposed to be exhorting one another. And, and what does that mean? It means that when we come together, that we worship together, it's for an opportunity for growth. We're supposed to edify and convince and reprove and encourage and it is with those who, who understand what we believe that we're trying to do that. And so we remember the Word of God, and then we commit to it. And that's why when Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that is a commitment. Paul was one of those who took the path of least resistance and went along with all of the things that he had learned from the Jews. And then Paul became the one who said, I'm going to face whatever I have to face to be a follower of God. We have a choice. It is what we will have an opportunity to do. So why are rivers crooked? Well, it is because they just simply flow where they could. But what the prophet says is that he makes the crooked places straight for us. Remember we read that God can turn... Uh, darkness into light. He can make crooked places straight. God is going to defy human nature by providing us with an opportunity to live on the straight path. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, you're ready to do that, we're ready to help you with that. And for the rest of us, hey, it is human, it is natural to take the path of least resistance and just go with the flow or you're going to have to buck the flow and you're going to have to say and do and show and live what makes us different than the world. But that's a choice. If you have a need to ask for help, for strength, for forgiveness, we want to encourage you to do that right now as together we stand and as we sing this song. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed.